So on today's episode, an external digital to analog converter with a vacuum tube. So how cool is that? Let's find out in this video. Well, hello there everyone and welcome to a new video over here on Anton's Hardware Channel. Now today we're going to talk about this one. It's the inline amp USB and it's an external sound card which is supposed to have a signal to noise ratio of 110 decibels. It's supposed to be 32 bits and have a sampling rate of 384 kilohertz. Now, especially those last two numbers, uh, well, they seem to be really impressive. I mean, only the high-end sound cards that I have at this moment are 32 bits, and those are the AE5 and the EVGA NU. All the other sound cards that I have, well, are just, just 24 bits and 192 kilohertz. So this must be a really good sound card, especially because it has a vacuum tube on it, which is the amplifier. But we'll get into that a bit later on. First off, I must mention at the start of this video that I got this uh, review sample sent to me by Inline. Um, I'm not getting paid or anything, but I just just feel sort of okay to tell you this at the start of the video. Um, I got this one for free because it's really expensive in the shops and I'll get back to that a bit later on as well. Um, but what about those specifications? Let's head over there. Now this external sound card can drive headsets from 16 to 600 ohms, which is kind of standard if you have a powered USB sound card. For those sound cards that are powered by the USB, well, it mostly is up to 150 ohms. But since the well target group for this external sound card is, well, the upper classes, the hi-fi classes, I'd say that the 600 ohms is, well, more than welcome. The external power supply uses about 4,9 um, watts if powering a 32 ohm headset. If it's not turned on, it will it will still consume some power, which is just 0,9 watts, which isn't that big, but still it would be nice if it was just 0,0. .0. It has some cool LED ind indicators for DSD and PCM playback, and some indicators for what resolution is used at that moment. Now when switching to another resolution, it automatically changes as well. There's also an indicator which shows if you're if there's any sound being produced, as you can see here. The LED isn't working that synchronous with the beat, but hey, at least it functions. And now for two big mysteries which I just cannot solve. Those 32 bits, are they from the start to finish? 32 bits. Well, that needs a bit more investigation. So let's dig a bit deeper. And now for the mystery. The inline amp USB claims it supports 384 kilohertz and 32 bits. Now when we look at the data sheet of the USB audio streaming controller used, that is true. The Bra Bravo DSD SA9227 is a very capable chip indeed, and these specifications are impressive also. But when we look at the digital to analog converter being used, we see that it's a Cirrus Logic CS4392, which isn't capable of 32 bits at all. It's just capable of 24 bits and 192 kilohertz. So not the complete path is 32 bits. So what's going on here? Well, I emailed Inline and their answer was as follows. The chipset of the Savitech CS4392 supports the throughput of 32 bits, 384 kilohertz. And that my datasheet, which I'm showing you here, is out of date. Well, I was looking for another datasheet, but I just couldn't find it. So I'm also sort of guessing that they're not aware that the Savitech and the Cirrus Logic chip are two distinct components, but hell, who am I? Now there are a couple of answers to this mystery. 
What I think is happening is that the Bravo USB audio streamer streaming is only used for transporting the signal to the device itself and then leaves the decoding to both the headphone out and the line out to the Sears logic. But that does make that the complete path of this device is not completely 32 bits. After decoding, the signal is then amplified by the LM4562 by Texas Instruments, an amplifier that has been used by a lot of devices. I mean, it's a capable amp, but nothing special. And there arrives another mystery. If there's a Texas Instruments amplifier on board, the op amp, what does the vacuum do? At first I thought it was just for show because it seems like it has a small LED in the bottom which makes it light up. But if I remove the tube, no sound can be heard. So it must be doing something or at least just act as a pass through. It seems like a legit vacuum amp, but I'm not sure if it does anything. So again, either the LM4560 to amplifies the line out or only the headset or maybe both, but again, I just don't know. Now when I got this external sound card, I was really anxious to start listening to it because well, I wanted to find out how good it was. I mean, 32 bits, 384 kilohertz, and it has a vacuum tube on it, which is supposed to give a warmer feeling to sound. And well, I started to listen and well, I wasn't blown away as I thought I would be. I mean, well, the bases were there, they were kind of oomphy, but that's mainly, I think, because it has an external power supply. The middles were there, but they were sort of uninspiring. The highs were also there. They weren't as sharp, but I think that's due to the vacuum tube, if that's the one that's used. And also, well, the stereo picture wasn't that great. I mean, it wasn't completely stereo. Um, it was somewhere between mono and stereo. And when I ran Rightmark Audio Analyzer, I found out why that is. The results Rightmark Audio Analyzer gave me weren't that impressive to say the least. As a matter of fact, they're rather disappointing. Well, let's go over them. Although the frequency response gets a very good, there are some issues here that I'd like to address. First off, there's a big difference between the green and the white line, meaning that there is a difference in output. The right channel is louder than the left channel. Also, you can see a lot of wobbly bits going on there, which makes that some frequencies may sound louder than others. Now, both the total harmonic distortion plus noise and the stereo crosstalk get a pour. For the stereo crosstalk, that means that there is sound bleeding from one channel to the other channel. And this is what I heard during my listening sessions. Also, I must add that this is something that most external sound cards suffer from, so it's not just this one. It's just one of the worst ratings that I've seen on an external sound card. And now for my conclusion, well, I think this sound card looks really cool. I mean, the vacuum tube makes it really cool. And the fact that you, you can plug in either a 6.35 or a 3.5 millimeter jack into it. The fact that it supports all the way up to 600 ohms is really cool. And all of those things, including the 32 bits, 384 kilohertz, make it seem like it's a really high-end product. But as we have seen, it's not so high-end after all. I mean, the components used aren't that great. They're that exciting. And also Rightmark Audio Analyzer didn't give it such a high score. At least, well, if you look at the price, which is almost 250 euros for a regular price. I mean, 250 euros, you can get an EVGA NU, which is 32 bits, which is really good in sound quality. You can get an AE5, maybe even two EA5s for that price. And that card is a lot better than this one. So people, um, I definitely cannot recommend this sound card. It's way too expensive. And even if it was 100 euros, I still wouldn't recommend it because the sound quality just isn't good enough. Maybe if it's 30, 40 euros, you could give it a go because it looks cool on your desk and you can impress your friends with it. But otherwise, steer clear of this sound card because it's just well, not good at all. Now, thank you for now for making it all the way to the end of this video. It's maybe a bit long, a bit longer than usual, 
but I still hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you in the next one, which will be a Christmas special. Woo. Thank you for now. Bye bye.